Hello and welcome to Minter Dialogue, episode number 471. My name is Minter Dial and I'm your host for this podcast, a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. For more information or to check out other shows on the network, please visit evergreenpodcasts.com. This week's interview is with Carolyn Duar. Carolyn is a senior partner at McKinsey, who founded and co-leads the McKinsey CEO and Board Excellence Service Line, in which role she advises many Fortune 100 CEOs. She's published more than 30 articles in the Harvard Business Review and McKinsey Quarterly, and is a frequent keynote speaker. Her latest book, CEO Excellence, The Six Mindsets That Distinguish the Best Leaders from the Rest, published by Scribner, was co-written with Scott Keller and Vic Malhotra. In this conversation with Carolyn, we discuss special insights from her interviews with CEOs, having the right mindset for tomorrow's challenges, the differences between male and female leaders, authenticity and flexibility, and much more. You'll find all the show notes on minterdial.com. Please do consider the drop in your rating and review, and don't forget to subscribe to catch all the future episodes. Now for the show. Carolyn Dewar, great to have you on my show. You are the co-author of this fabulous new book, CEO Excellence, fully invested in this concept of making better leaders. Your book is published by Scribner uh, on sale as of the 15th of March. Is that the Ides of March? I can't remember. Oh, and no, even- it was an auspicious date. <laughs> You co-wrote it with Scott Keller and Vic Malhotra. In your own words, how would you like to describe yourself, Carolyn? Sure, I am Carolyn Dewar. Um, professionally, I'm a, a senior partner at McKinsey & Company, Canadian by birth and living now out in, in the US on the West Coast. And I've been with the firm for about 22 years, um, have you know, a husband and two young kids and kind of, yeah, enjoying life out here, escaped the snow from Canada. A. A, exactly. Out and about. <laughs> yeah, I lived in I lived in Montreal for, for nearly four years. So I definitely know uh, can I ran L'Oreal's uh, division for professional hairdressers out of Montreal and got to visit Saskatchewan and PEI and the Maritimes and all that. So listen, um, you wrote this book. Uh, what was the inspiration for writing this book? I mean, you you did a lot of research, obviously, but how did you guys collate together to come to write this book? Yeah, I mean, I think there's this sort of the formal and the informal reason. I think the informal is we were at an event together that we put together for folks aspiring to be CEOs. And it was over the course of a couple of days. And we had guest speakers, really iconic CEOs come in and speak to them each day. And each time we, we asked them, what is the CEO role? And they gave a very clear, compelling answer. The CEO role is these two things or these three things. And the first day, everyone listened and nodded, and it sounded like a good answer. The next day, the CEO spoke and gave an equally compelling but entirely different answer. And then the same again on the third day. And I think it was on the drive home from that, we said, well, if we were a participant, we would be engaged but thoroughly confused. And we really wanted to set out to kind of demystify this CEO role that we hear so much about that, that plays so large on our world stage and, and the communities we live in. What is the role anyway? And most importantly, how do you do it well? So we really looked at folks who've excelled in the role and tried to understand how they think differently, what they do differently, so that we can all learn. I think we thought we were writing a CEO book and really 90% of what we learned applies to all of us. All of us. Uh, what do you mean by all of us? Well, I think, I mean, most easily all of us as leaders or business leaders, but frankly, just even in life, when you think about what a CEO's role is, is to set a very compelling direction, right? Where are we going? Align and mobilize their team and their organization to be able to make it happen work with their stakeholders, whether it's their board or their increasing set of external stakeholders, and then manage themselves personally, right? Manage their own time and energy. All of us have to do all of those things day to day. They perhaps just have to do it at the biggest scale of anyone. So if it works for them, I figure the lessons learned work for us as well. Beautiful. 
So you, you have many uh, CEOs that you interviewed, uh, researched for the for the book, which obviously is very exciting. And um, given McKinsey, you had access to some of the best up there. So that was really fun to read. You talk about the insights that they provided and like the, the conference where you went, where you had these three days and different um, folks for different strokes, I suppose. What would be one or two of the most surprising insights that you picked or, or got from the CEOs that you interviewed? That's a great question. And it's a long book in part because we had trouble whittling it down, I will admit. But a couple of the insights, I think one is to this first question of what is the CEO role. I think everyone knows that it's a lot of things. And yes, we worked and defined all the aspects of the role. But I think we were surprised how much of the job is about the fact that you are doing all of those things at once. You really are the ultimate integrator. And so it's not just being able to kind of spin these six plates of the role, but there's actual work that only you can do because you have all of that, right? If, if I make it concrete, Satya Nadella at Microsoft, when we talked to him, he said, look, I know it's a lonely role. Everyone says that. And there's social reasons why it's lonely. He said, for me, the reason it's lonely is an information asymmetry problem. No one underneath you sees everything that you see. No one above you, your board, your stakeholders see everything you see. You're sort of this single node of integration. So given that, there's work that if you don't do it, no one else will, right? You're connecting the dots between places. You're making sure it all hangs together. You're reconciling some of the inbuilt tensions of short-term versus long-term, you know, shareholder view versus multi-stakeholder view. All of these pieces really do come to you. Um, and I think we were just surprised by, it's not just being a big business leader, it's actually leading in a whole new way, right? So, so that was that was a big one and has all kinds of ripple effects. Can I just uh, quickly sort of talk to that point? Because as someone who's run a business, I, I totally get that point. And then I would really frown or try to figure out this notion of how do you then parse out or and delegate things where I'm the only one that knows everything as a CEO. And so specifically, I'm thinking of things like digital, or I'm thinking about um, diversity, or uh, ecology, or anything, you know, environmental components, ESG, where your responsibility of and, and knowing all the nodes, and understanding the bigger picture, if you don't do it, if you aren't it as a CEO, giving that title to somebody else, it, it can be debilitating and, and not very successful if you're trying to infuse diversity, if you're trying to transform towards digitality or any of these other things and trying to be more eco-friendly or have empathy or whatever the, the skill that you're trying to bring in. If you don't have it, if you don't own it, it's hard to give it to somebody else. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a it's a really powerful and common kind of conundrum that leaders find themselves in. Yet at the same time, you're the most scarce resource that your organization has, right? And you only have 24 hours in the day, even if you worked all of them. And so what is the highest and best use of your time? What is the role that only you can play, even against one of those priorities? So you talked about diversity. Others talk about you know, different cultural you know, drivers that you're trying to have. And most of the CEOs we talked to had a very clear view, for example, on a specific cultural shift they were trying to drive in the organization. And note, I said a shift, not eight or 10, or you, know, you get these really long lists. Almost to a person, they had a single cultural theme that they thought, for now, this will be our biggest unlock. This is the one. And I can't outsource it to HR, to others to make happen. I can enroll them in helping me, but I, but I can't hand it off and say it's going to take care of. They spent real time on it. It started with role modeling, right? What does that mean for their own leadership? How will they role model from the top? That that's how we're going to work or that's what we're standing for. How will they build in accountability? You know, if we're not to your example, moving the numbers on diversity, not just representation, but people feeling included. How will I actually hold people accountable and measure it? 
So it's not just a best efforts basis. They treated those quote softer shifts with as much rigor as they would any operational priority or any financial priority. You have to name it, measure it, hold them accountable, have real activities driven. Doesn't mean you have to do all the activities, others that can be doing it, but at the top of the house, you have to treat it with as much rigor as anything else and, and make sure that it's happening. And I think that's your role is to make sure the impact is happening. It's not that you have to do all the activity. There's something of a danger, I feel, that uh, like using best practices or suggesting that this is the right way to do things. Because at the end of the day, there's the one who's successful and then the one that looks good. And so you could have the, the CEO who's really kind, got uh, big diversity numbers or, or whatever, but maybe the shareholder numbers aren't following through in the same way. So how do you parse out success versus what would appear to be an attractive CEO style? Sure. And we had to wrestle with that right up front as we decided who to interview and who to even. And so you can imagine McKinsey, we took a pretty analytical approach, right? We had a whole database of thousands of CEOs and their performance and all those things. But in terms of who to talk to and get ideas from, we started out with this, anyone who'd been a CEO of a Forbes 2000 company since 2000. And there's about 3,500 of those. And from that, we put them through a number of filters. The first is performance, shareholder performance, because it matters, right? And we, we wanted to make sure that they had delivered, you know, top two quintiles, right? Top 40% performance relative to their industry peers, right? So to account for the fact that, you know, tech goes one way and other industries go another. So you had to have outperformed your peers in, per, in numbers performance. But we didn't stop there, right? The second one was, we actually only talked to folks who had been in role for at least six years. And it's not that there was a magical number with six, but we wanted to make sure you'd been around long enough to have had to eat your own cooking, right? That the decisions you made in your first few years, you're still there having to kind of experience what the impact of that was. And that you were on to probably your, not your first, but your second S-curve of where you were gonna take the company. So tenure mattered. And then we put folks through a number of more qualitative uh, filters, reputation, had there been crises of your own making, right? Other behavioral things, how were the markets, you know, and other late leaders lists of innovation and leadership and diversity, how did you show up on those? And for those who had retired, how well did your handover go, right? If you performed really well, and then the minute you walked out the door, the whole thing fell off a cliff, had you really built an organization that was enduring? It's not perfect, but we wanted to be as rigorous as we could to say who really has excelled in the role. And then from there, to your point, we weren't trying to catalog all their behaviors and all the things they did, although we have lots of stories. What we discovered is there was much more commonality in their mindsets, which is why we talk about the mindsets that, that distinguish how they thought about the role was quite remarkable and in many cases quite different from the quote average CEO. And if you can understand that mindset and think of the role in those ways, you can figure out the way to operationalize that for yourself, right? There's lots of micro habits and behaviors, but there were certain mindsets that were remarkably consistent amongst the top performers. Well, um, my first company, when I, which I created after leaving L'Oreal after 16 years there, was called The Mindset. Uh, but I put a Y instead of the I, A, because it was available, um, but also because it was really about putting the Y into business, which, of course, I, I noticed is something of importance within your thing. So I, I fully subscribe to that. And my singularly most interesting thought that I brought, I took out of your book, really, I mean, there's so many, but was this, um, the idea you wrote about the difference between a politician and a statesman where the, the politician is always worried about the next election, whereas the statement, statesman is more concerned about the next generation. And I thought that that was a really powerful thing, but whether it's that or humility or authenticity, the issue at some level I feel is how do you get somebody, typically a man who doesn't have that attitude, who's all about creating my generation, you know, my thing, my legacy right away, and doesn't really care about the incoming CEO, doesn't have humility. 
how do they convert these mindsets if they don't absolutely have them in the first place? That's a fascinating question. I do think there's been quite a shift or evolution in the expectation of leaders, right? And how we need to lead. And I do think that the era of the kind of all knowing, egoist, charismatic CEO, you know, we, you, gotcha. just, you don't see them as much anymore. Maybe in the founder CEO space to be perfectly transparent, where I think there's some degrees of freedom there that are different. But for, you know, CEOs of publicly traded companies, the job is just too big to think that you know it all, right? You think about all of the external pulls on your time and attention, all of the issues you're being asked to grapple with. Most of the CEOs we talk to have realized now by design, they were all at least six years in tenure. So maybe there was some lessons learned here that it was it couldn't be all about them and it wasn't all about them. And there was some really inspiring stories of like you're in the chair for a certain period of time and the company is gonna go on beyond you and your role is to leave it kind of better than you found it. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from this recognition that it takes the whole company to actually deliver impact and to make it happen. And frankly, there's a lot less patience now for someone who doesn't recognize that. Um, so I'd like to think that boards are, are selecting for people more and more with some of these mindsets. And for those who don't come in with them, I think they're learning lessons pretty hard and fast that if they don't have a team, if they're not aligning and energizing a whole organization underneath them, no one's gonna follow. That's just well, not the way people work anymore. Yeah, and, and well, for having been on, and, and I'm serving on a few boards, the issue at some level is that the Board of Governors has done their job, if you will, mm -hmm. and they may not be, uh, have the diversity, you know, we, that's a, a, a strong problem. The governance model may not be up to date. I mean, most of the boards I've been on, the, the insertion of marketing concepts and humility uh, to take another is, is very often not present amongst mm -hmm. board governors because they all come with history, success, sometimes titles and, and money and and they're they're not necessarily equipped. So the having the right board is also extremely important because their job is to select the CEO as well as maintain the remuneration. Absolutely. And I think how CEOs work with boards was one of the big distinguishing things that we found, right? At least from the CEO point of view, you know, if the prevailing mindset is almost the board is something at worst to be sort of tolerated and brought along and I got through the board meeting, now I can get back to running my business. These CEOs thought quite differently, and it was quite surprising, to be honest. They had a much more transparent relationship with their board, the, the high performers we talked to. And their mindset was one much more of, how do I help the directors to help me and help my business? And what would have to be true for those directors to genuinely be helpful? And, and you've named one already. Number one, you actually need to have the right people on the board. Right? And obviously with different governance, it's not the CEO's prerogative to, but how do they work with the lead director or with the exec chair over time to say, do we actually have the skills and capabilities on the board that we need to be relevant given where we're taking the company? Right? If you're gonna do a big international expansion and everyone on your board grew up in the same hometown, like, is that really gonna get you there? Right? And so number one is, do you have the right voices on the board? And I think we're seeing that evolve. And then number two is, are you engaging with them in a way where their job isn't done at the selection point, right? They're actually playing an active role in helping, not just from a fiduciary responsibility point of view, but where their expertise are helpful, are you drawing them in? Do you, are you giving them enough information about the business that they know how to help, right? This isn't deluging them with 300, 600 page binders, right? But I think Jamie Diamond, you know, he literally pulls out a piece of paper and says, Here's the things that happened since last we met, right? Ivan at Diageo has a seven by seven list. The seven things that are going really well that I want you to know about, the seven things that are keeping me up at night. I'm not asking you to do anything yet, but I need you to know. So if I come back to you in a few months time and it's hit the fan, you, you knew it was coming and, and we have the context, right? It's quite a different approach, I think, to the, take some confidence as a CEO to be willing to engage in that way. Yeah, it, to to admit uh, you know, issues and you know, and I'll, no, I'm not perfect, which is at some level some 
big part of the humility piece, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I, so many fun questions. Uh, one of them I was going to ask you, Carolyn, in that as a woman, I was wondering to what extent or was there any observation of differences amongst female and male CEOs? Did you, or if that wasn't a distinguishing feature, did you have any other features that pop out in your mind as you interviewed all these CEOs? That's an interesting question. So we did push hard to make sure we had some, not as many as I'd like. There's eight of the 67 uh, that are female CEOs. They popped out for me, by the way. Sorry? They popped out for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and part of it, to be fair, we, we might have done a bit of an own goal in that requiring six years of tenure knocks out a lot of the much more recent appointments, right? And so there, there's a little bit there too. But so for, for the women that we talk to, they're incredible leaders. And, and to be honest, what they had to do to get where they did, to have already been in role, they were appointed 10 years ago, right? And so you kind of do that huge, huge kind of respect for what they had to do to get where they did, right? And, and by design on that, to be honest, some of them were a little hesitant to want to talk about being a female CEO, or they, or they mentioned that they were hesitant to earlier in their tenure, because frankly, they got where they were by playing the boys game. I'm just sort of saying it. I think now as they're kind of later in tenure, they're a little bit, or in some cases retired, willing to lean into and talk about how they may we had to, to lead differently. Um, one thing that did strike me, not just the women, but more predominantly the women, when we talked about managing your calendar and your time and the support system around you, you know, they just saw no boundary between work and home and life and kids and all of those things, right? These are all consuming jobs. And they had very practical tips about how you have to manage your whole life together, right? Plotting your joint calendar out for a year with the board meetings and your kids' baseball tournaments, right? And just how do you make this life work? I think they were much more transparent about that as opposed to their job was to work and there was someone else at home taking care of the rest of life, right? I think that those stories were, were quite obvious when they came out, um, which was interesting. So many people ask me how I felt when George Floyd was killed. And as I sit across a table from a black man, who's about to talk about how the murder of another black man felt. I don't think it really matters how I feel. Hello, I'm Stephen Dorsey, host of Black and White from Evergreen Podcasts. We'll explore and explain how white advantage, bias, and outright discrimination continues to plague our society. Black and White is available wherever you listen to podcasts. Well, I, I studied women's studies at university in 1985. Uh, so at the time, it was sort of somewhat novel. And so I've, I've had a long uh, history of looking at the, the idea of, of the female mind, the female narrative, the female life in general, and the idea of authenticity comes to mind. I mean, not that women are naturally more authentic, but it is my observation that women naturally look at the big picture all the time, the sleep, children, biology, and, and emotions. And, 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 you know, let's say the, the old stereotype or archetype might sort of frivolously want to compartmentalize all those. Elements. That's not what's getting the shareholder money back. Yet sleep, gosh, kind of useful for having energy, which you write about, um, feeling happy and, and, and understanding your emotions so important, so self-awareness, and, and, and obviously being able to understand other people's emotions and so on and so forth. So I, I've long felt that there's something. And then the other thing which is interesting is Indians, because, you know, the, the, the sorry, the subcontinent of India, let's say, they have, there is, a I feel, a, um, a, a higher proportion of Indian bred or Indian cultured CEOs you, you obviously talk about Satya Nadella, but there are many others mm -hmm. that have yeah, appeared. Raja Banga, we have, I mean, even in our book, we have a whole... Yes, set. exactly. So I was wondering, did you have any conversations with your co-authors about this topic, or is that just something you sort of wanted to brush aside? That's interesting. I haven't, particularly, it would be an interesting conversation to have. 
it is notable too, you know, outside of China, outside of Japan, there's very few Chinese and Japanese CEOs, right? So when you look at other, you know, it's an interesting story about we think about leadership and our view of what a leader is and what characteristics they have. Is there a bias towards, you know, leadership qualities from certain cultures? What does that look like? How does that show up differently? Um, I think well, it's, it's bias makes it sound negative. Sorry, no, um, yeah, bias may, I was struggling with, it's not the right word either. Right. Um, it, a filter it, in it, any it, event. Yeah. I, sir, I, and I think that at the end yeah. of the day, you know, there's some realities that let's call them stereotypes, but <laughs> they, they have some reality based in certain cultural Re, you know, realities, right? You know, that's right. just the way it is. So um, one of the, the things that you talk about in the book uh, is um, authenticity uh, quite a lot. And um, you also try to sort of establish a balance between authenticity being a way and flexibility being, let's say, situational in the, in the specific point. So how does... How has this authenticity in your mind become such a key attribute? You kind of think of, duh, of course mm -hmm. you have to be authentic. But mm -hmm. in reality, we're far from it, always been far from it. But where has it, why has it come up to be such a big point today, do you think? Um, authenticity, you're right. I think it's so important and probably wasn't a big part of the, of the dialogue on leadership, even a few years ago as much. Think about the pandemic. I think that has forced a radical acceleration of this view and expectation. You literally saw inside people's homes, right? Their, their dog walked by, you know, they were out for a walk. CEOs maybe that in the past had full makeup studio set up with a pre-recorded town hall suddenly didn't have any of that. And they had to just get on their iPhone and you know, talk to 5,000 employees unscripted about what had happened that day because we were all moving so fast. I think people saw a window and frankly, a number of organizations, their employee engagement scores and their connection to leadership scores went up during the pandemic. You could have a Zoom with hundreds of people on it. It was an accessibility that was different. It was unscripted, it was fast moving. And then you marry that with, I think, an expectation of younger generations of talent, where frankly, the idea of it being hierarchical and scripted and not accessible is just not something they're gonna sign up for. Those two things together, I think it means we can't just go back. So the leaders that are hoping they can go back into their perfect bubble of not having to show up in that way, I think you know, the talent demands are showing that that's, that's not what people expect or will accept anymore. And I think leaders who've done it well have enjoyed it, right? They've been able to be themselves. I think they've been a bit out of their comfort zone, but they've seen a, a real shift. Um, so this is, when we think about what from the pandemic we'll learn and take forward, I think this is an interesting one, right? Will we be more human the way we had to be in those modes? And will we, will we carry that forward a little bit? Oh, yes. A, 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 a valiant and big question. I think that the trend of authenticity was well present before the pandemic. I, I certainly believe the pandemic accelerated it. One of the things within that authenticity story maybe is transparency and social media. So I was wondering what, what advice you feel is relevant now for a CEO with regard to social media, should she or he be on social? To what extent should he or she be really transparent, really authentic on social? How, how does that play out in your understanding of, of the roles of the CEO for today? Mm -hmm. I think one thing CEOs are learning is because of transparency, whether it's across social or just their employees talking, customers, regulators, all the stakeholders, you can't, you can't try and compartmentalize who you are and your brand in different audiences. You're gonna get found out, right? And so I do think there's something about deciding who are you as a leader that's authentic, but also in keeping with what your organization needs of its leader in this moment, right? So some of that might be your natural strength. A few of those aspects might be pushing you, but it's what your organization needs. And then you need to show up in that way whether it's in your, your leadership meetings, which used to be 
small, but who knows what someone's going to tweet out of a meeting these days, right? To your broader town halls, your social media with regulators, with community groups, with customers. I, I think you need to have that grounding of who you are and be and be consistent. I think that's what people are realizing. Well, um, my last book was uh, called You Lead. And uh, the idea was actually getting to know who you are. And I find that that point is, um, well, it's, it needs more texture because in the end of the day, to know who you are, as my friend Michelle Navarre said, takes more than a lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so uh, if anyone even thinks that they know who they are, they, they probably don't have sufficient humility to recognize that they're off piste. And, and, and it's, I feel like the hardest thing that CEOs really do need to do, which is to spend time with themselves in, in peace and presence, where they really understand who they are, what their foibles, issues, because you want to, like you say in the book, you, you want to be authentic, but it doesn't mean you can be a shit, you know, because maybe that's just who I am. Well, that's not yeah. enough, right? Yeah. So, or, but then you need to recognize you're a shit. Yeah. and where you need to improve and, and how you need to improve. And, uh, and one of the ideas I really loved in your book um, is about this notion of having um, advisors, the kitchen cabinet idea, people who can call you to task. In my case, it's always been my wife. She has been my fiercest and most loyal critic behind, able to tell me every time, all the time, what it's like and where I need to be better. And, you know, I say, I suppose behind every great man is a better wife, a better woman. It, you know, maybe that's a sexist and old fashioned term, but at the same time, it's this notion of having a partner, uh, partners who are able to call you out and say, you know, Carolyn. So um, I know that was a little bit of a spiel. You can certainly re rebut that or, or, or comment it, but I would like to talk to you about how leadership is within McKinsey. And, and just to power, at least to put this in context, as a, as a writer myself, I've written about empathy, I've written about authentic leadership, and, and at sometimes I get the, you know, well, Minter, that wasn't very empathic, or Minter, you, you, you know, that's not exactly you. So you, Carolyn, within your leadership role within McKinsey, all the number of partners you have, to what extent are people within McKinsey reading your book, doing your book, and, and how does that, I would just love to have you comment about that. So I worked in business. Yeah, nothing's perfect. But I'd like you, since you guys are consultants about leadership, how does that roll within your business? In terms of how we're leading ourselves? Well, yes. And, and taking on what CEO excellence is within the company, because obviously there are CEOs and then you're all somehow mini CEOs as partners, usually within McKinsey. It's a good question. And I'm thinking about it real time as you're talking. I think in a way, some of the evolutions we're describing in the book of the role make it edge it towards being more similar to the messiness of McKinsey or not. We're, we're a private partnership, right? And so in a way, we never were maybe what companies were in the 80s where there was a you know, single focus on financials and a single leader who could tell you what to do in a hierarchical firm. We've never been that. We've always been super messy. And so when we think about what leaders need to do to bring along stakeholders, to constantly be listening, to be aligning and mobilizing and telling a compelling story. That's how we have to lead because as you say, we're all fairly independent. Um, and so what does that look like for us? I think, I think all those lessons learned certainly apply. I do wanna come back to your kitchen cabinet point because I've seen a few interesting models there, right? Of how do CEOs or any leader stay grounded? There's, there's empirical research to show as you get more senior, you actually lose the ability to tell whether someone's really laughing at your joke or not. I mean, you truly are in an echo chamber. So yeah, I, I mean, they, they talk about, be, they talk about yeah. lack of empathy. There's a, there's a strong index of as you get successful in the big of the title, and if you're a male in particular, um, and you're earning a certain amount, your empathy level is lower, which is essentially the same at some level, understanding whether what is the person actually thinking, feeling, and laughing about? Yeah, it's fascinating, right? So what are you gonna to do to counteract that? I think you know, some leaders have um, some folks in their, on their own team, maybe two or three people who are their kind of inner cabinet. A lot of them talked about having some external voices. Sometimes it was the previous CEO, maybe it was a previous mentor, 
maybe it was a friend they respected who had relevant experience, where they had a couple of people who they could problem solve with and they almost split apart. There's people you want to be able to problem solve with in a safe space, because you don't want to admit more broadly that you don't know, right? And so who can you actually work things through with in your thinking? That's one group that you need. And there might be overlap of people. There's another group of people who need to tell you the truth to your, to your point of, look, you're way off the mark. No one's agreeing with you, but no one's willing to tell you. You were tone deaf in that meeting. You know, who's going to be some of your truth tellers to say, here's what's going really well. And here's your blind spots that you need to know about. And then the third category, which I find really intriguing, a number of the CEOs had reverse mentors. So folks by design who were either several levels down in the organization or several generations younger, right? Especially as we're thinking about shifting consumer needs, move to digital, all of these things, who they explicitly set up a relationship with to you know, teach me, show me the ways, keep me relevant, keep me current, keep me young, essentially, on some of these points and give me feedback. And I think those are fascinating relationships because it's a real learning mindset. Um, but also creating the safe space for the person to to tell you how it really is. You know, in listening to you, it, it may be a little bit late, but I, I certainly think that's one of the areas that I was really poorest at myself when I was running my own company or the company was being explicit about the people that I considered mentors, uh, lower or higher or peers. And, and and retrospectively, what's happened is I realized that they were mentors, but I didn't really consider them as such. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the failings that I had to have that uh, maybe humility sufficient to say that I really needed them. I, and, and maybe never said to them, hey, I need you. And mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's uh, my little moment of, aha, uh -huh. yikes. Mm -hmm. I'm beautiful. Um, so energy you, you you do talk a lot about the, the the fact that as a ceo you need to manage yourself and and understand your energies and i've had on my podcast i mean i don't know how many ceos of the 500 guests i've had and uh, many of them or several of them anyway have identified or thought of themselves as energizers so that they need to uh, mobilize the word you used earlier in in the chat uh, or energize people, motivate people. 70% of employees uh, self-describe themselves as disengaged at work. So it's, uh, you know, so if you can put a Bunsen burner on everybody, then that's pretty great. To what extent do you think that a CEO ought to be the energizer? That's a great question. I do think it's implicit in the role that how you do it might be different depending on your personality and your style, but your role is to you know, inspire people with a vision of where you're headed and how you're gonna get there, to help them each realize how their role every day plays a part in that, um, to encourage the right mindsets and behaviors for how we're gonna operate to get that done together. I mean, that, that is your role. Some CEOs talk about being you know, the ultimate storyteller or the ultimate cheerleader, right? That is a, a huge piece of this. If you just put your head down and kind of make sure we deliver, you're, you're missing the boat. And increasingly you're energizing external stakeholders too, right? Bringing along the board, bringing along your investors on the story of where you're going and, and other stakeholders. I think what, what CEOs need to, think about is for them to be able to play that role, they need to manage their own energy, right? And, and have some real self-awareness around what gives them energy, what drains them day to day. And that's not so much a work versus out of work split, right? Laundry drains me. <laughs> Having a conversation like this gives me energy. So it's not, it's not you know, that clear split. But the ones we talked to were really deliberate, almost surprisingly deliberate about their calendar and managing that energy and whether it was working with their executive assistant or their chief of staff, but they thought about their day, their week, in many cases, their month and year to make sure, yes, they had the big hard things in there, the things that just have to get done, but that they sequenced it with enough things that gave them energy. For some, it might be going and doing customer meetings that they're ultimately always still a sales guy. And that's so, you know, they make sure they have a few of those in there. Some people that's not their thing. And it's about 
town halls, or it's about having time in their calendar to think and be alone. And they actually need that to energize, to clarify their thinking, to be able to then come back out to the organization. So it's having the self-awareness to know what recharges you and how are you going to build that in? Um, because you need to be able to keep going for a while, right? We talk about this analogy of it's, it's not a marathon because you don't have the luxury of waiting and showing results at the very end, right? It's also not a sprint unless you only want to be there for a year, right? And so how are you going to manage through this series of sprints over time with moments of exertion, moments of, of re-energizing? Um, and, and you really have to be explicit if you want to be there for the long haul. I some completely subscribe to that. Uh, I mean, in general, I, I color code. I talk about how I color code my calendar. I do how, too. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> you're my green meeting today, Carol. Yeah, no, um, you're, which, you're, uh, that's hilarious. You're my green meeting too. I won't tell you what green means, but you're my green meeting. <laughs> well, well, green for me is new. Um, right. So I, I, I have a, one green meeting a day uh, in my mm -hmm. calendar because that's something I get energy from. And, and then the other thing I did with my assistants, uh, it was this complicity with my assistants. It was so important. Uh, they needed to understand me and, and, and every time it was a journey. But one of the things I insisted on as I got to the top of the old hierarchy was to have 50% of my day free. Wow. That's amazing. Because, well, A, I mean, I really think it's actually a sine qua non. I really believe it is necessary if you really want to run a company to have it. You need time free. to think. <laughs> well, you need time to think. You need time for shit that happens. You need time for somebody who walks in the door to say, listen, mentor, I need to talk to you. You need time to, um, you know, just to, to get energy, maybe whatever it is that you get energy from. Yeah. That's off the, off the piece, off piste. Because if you're yeah. constantly in meetings, uh, it's a shit storm. So um, yeah, I, I fully subscribe to that. And the idea that I really converted, I really don't think it's about energizing people. It's creating an environment where people get energy. I think mm, that's the, I love that reframe. the nuance that I, I kind of learned from it all. I wanted to just talk about two more topics. One is um, compensation. You talk about it, but not in depth. And I feel like a lot of boards get compensation wrong. And, and at some level, it's intimately related to the second question, which is about shareholders. But how does one get compensation right? Is it 19 and a half ratio to one? Uh, what is it? Where is it? What, 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 are, what are your insights into making compensation right for CEOs? I don't think there's an easy answer. I'll no. just say. I think it's messy. No one, yeah, it's messy. I think one thing that really struck us is by design, we were, were looking at the highest performing CEOs and those 200 CEOs delivered 5 trillion in excess value, the equivalent of the GDP of Japan versus their peers in role. And so there's something to be said that when you have a CEO who's high performing and doing it well, the value they're creating is enormous. But what that means is there is a lot of CEOs who are not creating that much excess value. And so there's something to be said for, are we really differentiating? Do we know what high performance looks like? Are we measuring it? And are we adjusting compensation based on it, right? Because there's plenty of CEOs out there making a ton of money who were not in that high performing list, right? So there's something about, are we willing to call it and separate out? But that implies that you know what good looks like. It implies that you know what the measurement of that is that can't just be quarterly and short term, right? Because if you're truly leading and building a great company, you have to be taking that long-term view. And I think that's where all these notions of multi-stakeholder capitalism and the business roundtable and all those things, it's starting to get very real in terms of how do we operationalize that? What does that actually mean in terms of the expectation on the company and the CEO for what they will deliver by when and for who? Um, and I think that's where we are, is really trying to net out what is the expectation now, right? And what does that look like? You look, you know, the pandemic where people were really having to manage across their, their stakeholder groups, balancing employee health, community health with near-term returns versus longer term. And then even most recently, you know, with Russia and Ukraine, it's probably the biggest, quickest 
pivot we've seen at least in North American companies make in terms of withdrawing, you know, what is the measurement of that? And whether that was the right decision for shareholders, for society, for employees, I, I think we're right in it right now. Yeah, well, it brings up the questions, things like ethics and okay. what is good. And, uh, and this idea of legacy, this notion of, of building for the next generation where Satya Nadella said, having a more successful CEO than me, replace me. And, and it, it, this is my second question, really, Carolyn, which is, how do, you, how do you improve shareholder awareness and mindset with regard to this? Because basically, Carolyn, let's not, you know, let's call a spade a spade. Shareholders are, are pretty darn short term focused. And, and unless you are the founder and own a lot of A shares or, or whatever it is, you know, let's call them Bezos, that you can manage the, the shareholder story and say, yeah, I'm on it. I'll be there because I'm interested too. Most CEOs don't, you know, are, are basically mercenaries or at least, you know, pie, pie, you know sh sh don't have a controlling stake in the company and, and have to deal with New York City uh, or Chicago or whatever, you know, start, you know, sh shareholders, if they're not aggressive and, and you know, also, you know, want to ship you out. So where are we with shareholders on this story? And, you know, maybe we have Blackstone, maybe we have a few on the shareholder council or whatever, the round table that are, are interested in this other thing, but it doesn't feel in the city or in the stock exchange at New York that they're, they're with the program just yet. Hmm. Um, I think by design, we didn't, we wanted to not over index on founder CEOs for that reason. We have Reed Hastings in there from Netflix and a couple of others, yeah. but we purposely didn't want to do that because you're right, they have degrees of freedom that others don't. I mean, one of my colleagues who spends a lot of time more in the investor corporate finance space, you know, said, always says you, you end up with the shareholders that you deserve. <laughs> um, and I know that's easier said than done, but there is something about when you have a really, really clear sense of purpose for your organization, I don't mean a pretty purpose statement on the wall. I mean a sense of why do we exist? What are we trying to do? Who are we trying to serve? And what is success for us? And you're able to communicate that in a compelling way. And it's congruent with all the decisions that you're making. And you're telling that story. Over time, you attract investors who believe in that story, right? And I do think we've found people you know, you think about, yeah, even some of the recent decisions with withdrawing from Russia, shareholders have largely understood what that was all about, right? They're not that short-sighted, but I think it needs to be very clear on where are you taking the company? How are we going to get from A to B? And, and here's what to expect. You know, there'll be a down and then we'll go to the up. I think the same kind of transparency that we talked about with the boards is bleeding over into investors. Right? Are you telling your story in an authentic way, and does it all add up? Because if it doesn't add up, they'll call you out on it. Yeah, I, I well, we have to say we're recording this, so it'll be published uh, certainly a little bit after we record it. Who knows what the future is? But I, I recall at, when I was a senior executive at L'Oreal that some extrinsic factor like this, we still need to make it up. Make it up. So mm -hmm. we might have, uh, you know, re, you know, taken out business in a certain part of the world because there was tsunami or there was a nuclear fission accident or whatever, we still had to make it up because the shareholders weren't exactly indulgent on these matters. And so um, it's still complicated. Well, um, this has been a lot of fun, Carolyn. I kind of am pissed because I had so many other fun questions I wanted to talk to you about the role of meaningful conversations uh, in, in the boardroom. Um, that's one of my hot topics, but it's going to have to be another time. Carolyn, how can anybody uh, get in touch with you if that's so you wish, or at least get your book, get in touch with what you're up to and talking about writing about? Sure, absolutely. Would be delighted to be in touch with, with anyone. I think the easiest way, probably a quick Google search, right? Carolyn Dewar, it's D-E-W-A-R, like the whiskey, but not close enough to be of any benefit. <laughs> Um, and CEO excellence. You take the two of them in, you'll find me. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much, Caroline. Great to talk to you. Thanks for having listened to this episode of the Minter Dialogue podcast. If you like the show and would like to support me, please consider a donation on patreon.com forward slash 
Minter Dial. You can also subscribe on your favorite podcast service. And as ever, rating and reviews are the real currency for podcasts. You'll find the show notes with over 2,000 and more blog posts on MinterDial.com. Check out my documentary film and four books, including my last one, You Lead, How Being Yourself Makes You a Better Leader. And to finish, here's a song I wrote with Stephanie Singer, A Convinced Man. So many people ask me how I felt when George Floyd was killed. 
And as I sit across a table from a black man who's about to talk about how the murder of another black man felt, I don't think it really matters how I feel. Hello, I'm Stephen Dorsey, host of Black and White from Evergreen Podcasts. We'll explore and explain how white advantage, bias, and outright discrimination continues to plague our society. Black and White is available wherever you listen to podcasts. 